All right, welcome to Good Shepherd tonight for part five of the Bible as Backstory. Um, really glad to see you all here tonight, and let's start with the opening prayer that we've been using, the Collect for Proper 28. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. All right, here we are. Um, first of all, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, when we started this series, I didn't really say anything about a particular end date, uh, and that's partially because I want to leave it up to you. The scope of the series as I originally envisioned it um, will end next week uh, as we lead into Pentecost. I was thinking of it as an Easter season thing that could be bookended there if that's what you like um, and that contains all the Easter vigil readings. We're going to cover two tonight and three next week uh, because they're a little more bite-sized and, and easier to digest in a short amount of time. Um, but that really is such the top skim tier of the Bible that uh, we, we could continue in the summer if you like, and I'd certainly be willing. So let me know either in the chat or offline um, what you would think of that, um, and we'll see where that goes. Um, so again, a reminder at the beginning of each one, I want to uh, mention uh, the, our definitions and our guiding assumptions. Um, but does anyone remember uh, the definition of uh, the Christian Bible or what the features of that are that we've been using? I'll just say it again. The Christian Bible is a library of ancient writings collected for corporate use as the genetic or adopted backstory for a Christian's life of faith. And what is a backstory? A history or background for a character in a story. As individual human beings, we have our own backstories. Guiding assumptions of this class. First, there is no such thing as a biblical text free of interpretation. Your cultural and personal backstories do some of the work of interpretation. And second, there's one we added last week. Don't ask the Bible, why did God do that? Instead, ask, why did an ancient tribe of people see fit to preserve this particular story about God so carefully? So first, check in. Any thoughts or realizations in the last week that, that you want to share before we proceed to Isaiah? All right, we'll give some ample space. That's good, that's fine. All right, so I wanna open with a quiz and uh, you get bonus points, not that we're keeping score of any points, but uh, you can have bonus points if you want. You can call them bonus points if you can answer this. What do we mean when we talk about the Exodus? That's, that's a pretty, um, pretty easy one for some people, I bet. What is the Exodus? Yeah, go ahead, KJ. It's, is it when they um, were led out of um, the desert? Yeah, out of Egypt, right? So the Exodus is out of slavery into the desert, into the wilderness um, and, and beyond, right? So freedom from slavery. So what's the difference between the Exodus and the exile? Two EX words. What is the exile? All right, I love to do this this kind of teaching. Nobody, okay. That's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, and exile, it's kind of a tricky question because exile happened in a couple of stages. But um, what I want to do is to help everyone here tonight be sure that you understand sort of the blow by blow events um, from the point where we left off with Moses all the way till we get to the prophets. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc. cetera. Uh, because that's the area we're skipping over tonight. We're skipping over a whole bunch of backstory right now um, in order to get to the rest of these Easter Vigil readings. So let's talk about the basic events and the order that they occurred in. Um, I'm going to put a timeline up on the screen for you. 
This is something I just found today, but it seems to be pretty good. This is uh, Kings and Prophets. I got this from, I don't know, it's called Bible.com or something like that. But I looked it over and it doesn't look too bad. It, uh, it doesn't have any nonsense about the world literally beginning in 4004 BC. Uh, that date, by the way, came from an Anglican, so we can blame uh, Archbishop Usher for that. Um, but this is a timeline that starts with the kingdom of Israel. So first, Moses and the Israelites come out of the desert. The traditional story is that they wander in the desert for 40 years. Uh, God does not allow them to go into the promised land until the whole generation that includes Moses has died and the next generation goes in. A long story there. They're in the promised land. There's the, the uh, okay, who can name their books of the Bible in order? How far can you get? Somebody start rattling them off. Go ahead, Billy. Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, verse 6, and 2 Chronicles. Okay, Derek, Derek, stop. You've gone too far. Billy, where, where did you leave off? First and second king. Good. That's where we want to stop. Okay. So we are going from Exodus, the second book of the Bible, all the way to second Kings today. And uh, the way that we'll get there is through this uh, entry into Canaan, into the promised land, which is detailed. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's what we call the Torah or the Pentateuch, right? This is the, the five books of Moses, the, the heart of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and that's where the law is given. Now, after that, we get into what's called the histories. So after Deuteronomy, we have Joshua, which describes the Israelites' entry into the promised land, into Canaan, and their, um, their subsequent conquest of it, of all the people who live there. Um, and then Judges. The period of the Judges would be the time when the Israelites were not really an especially organized people, except that they would occasionally uh, pick somebody to judge disputes among them. So imagine a place that has like one Supreme Court justice and, and then some lesser leaders after that. Uh, interestingly, one of the first judges was Deborah, a woman. Um, and uh, there's even a story in, uh, in Judges about how there was a big battle and Barak, who was the leader of the Israelites, would not go into battle unless Deborah went in first because uh, he, he couldn't fight without her. Um, so we have Joshua and then Judges. Uh, Judges is another whole thing. I'd love to cover that in the class. We have Ruth, but Ruth was stuck in there later, and that's a special case. We should talk about Ruth at another time. In fact, the uh, um, Jews don't put Ruth in that place in the Bible. I, I'm pretty sure they put her with the, the writings that come later. I could be wrong. Um, and then we have First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. Now, First and Second Chronicles come much, much, much later. They were written later. They are actually stuck at the end of the, of the Hebrew Bible. They are the last books in the Hebrew Bible, and they were added the last. Um, but First and Second Chronicles is really a retelling of First and Second Kings, such that if you never read First and Second Chronicles, uh, you're not missing much, uh, except maybe a, a more perspective on what it was like to live in the reconstructed kingdom many hundreds of years later. Um, the main point is that the, the time of the kings basically happens in First and Second Samuel and then First and Second Kings. We have the, uh, the first king, Saul, the second king, David, and the third king, Solomon. And all that together would make a wonderful TV miniseries. I'd love to see that sometime. It's very exciting and a lot of fun. Um, and then it's Solomon's children who split the kingdom. We have Israel in the north. Anyone know what the capital of Israel was in the north? That would be Samaria. And remember that because we'll have Samaritans later on. And then what's the capital of Judah in the south? This is an easy one. City of David? Zion? What do you call it? That would be Jerusalem. So we have Samaria, the capital of Israel, Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. And you see here in the green the kings of Israel going forward, and in the yellow on the bottom, the kings of Judah going forward. Now, um, so the, the um, pardon me for a moment, just getting my bearings. So we have the monarchy, we have the split of the kingdom, 
And then during this time, you'll see we also have some prophets. We have Elijah and Elisha, who are two of the most famous prophets. Um, they don't get their own books. Their stories are contained within, uh, within the books of Kings. And the, really, the story in those days was that like, starting around the time of David and moving on, you had a king, but then you also had this prophet class. And the idea of the prophets was to hold the kings accountable, sort of what their version of, uh, of checks and balances. So, for instance, when David has an affair and has the woman's husband killed, um, Nathan is there to call him up short. And that's a, that's a great story as well. Now, what we're doing is fast forwarding all the, t all the way forward to the time of the kings Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz in the south. And then these, uh, these quickly rotating kings up here in the north. And that's when Isaiah was a prophet in those days. So after you get through all the books of the histories, and you get First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, after that come the wisdom books, the writings, including the Psalms, the Proverbs, and you have wisdom literature like Job and Ecclesiastes, and, and those are written much, 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 much later. Remember the Old Testament, the, the order kind of breaks down after First and Second Kings as far as chronological. And then at the end, you have the book of the prophets, or all the, all the books of the prophets. Now, traditionally, there are five major prophets and 12 minor prophets. And the books of the prophets are arranged roughly in order of how long the books are. Uh, and so that's why they get those designations. Isaiah is one of the longest with 66 chapters. Um, but three of the main prophets that certainly you've heard of all of are Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah. Now, Isaiah comes first, if you can see on the uh, the diagram here. Actually, I'm going to zoom in a little. Here's Isaiah, and then Jeremiah comes later, and Ezekiel kind of overlaps with him. Um, and when, um, pardon me a moment, Amos and Hosea are also super important, and they're in a separate, uh, they, they come a little bit later. Daniel is in a whole class by himself, and we can talk about him later if you like. Um, but Isaiah is our focus for tonight. Now, think of it this way. With Jeremiah, who comes down here, the, the different prophets had different perspectives on what the problems were in Israel. Overall, their main issues with Israel were these two. Number one, the people are worshiping idols. They're, they're, they are um, swearing allegiance to gods other than Yahweh, and this is a problem. The other issue that they have is the people are mistreating the poor and the oppressed. They are oppressing their own people among them. So um, idolatry and social justice were really the main issues of the prophets. And, and really all the prophets were dealing with all of those things just with different emphases. The question became, when hardship happened to, to the Jews, what did this mean theologically, right? Um, because look up here, look what happens to the kingdom of Israel. You see all these kings, and then 722, boom, what happens? Now we're at the start of the exile. Assyria defeats Israel. The 10 northern tribes go into captivity. That is the end of that northern kingdom. It's just gone. Um, the people who remain intermarry with the Assyrians and the Samaritans wind up being basically sort of the descendants of those intermarriages and whatever else happened there. They wind up with their own religion that is very similar to Judaism in some ways. Um, similar enough that in Jesus' time, the Samaritans are the big bad, right? Because I'm not the big bad as far as a threat, but the big bad theologically as in, oh, they're just wrong. They're, because they're kind of like us, but they're not quite. So the north suffers its fate earlier. The Assyrians sweep in and defeat them. The south goes on for another 150 years down here in Judah. And in general, when we talk about the exile, this isn't the one up north that we're talking about. That kingdom just ended. So this is sort of, it's exilic, but really the exile we're talking about is what happens to Judah. And by this time, 150 years after the Assyrian invasion, the Babylonians have become the big player on the, on the world stage. They've subdued the Assyrians. They're even more powerful. And whereas Assyria was not able to take Judah, in fact, there's a dramatic story of how God prevents that from happening. 
150 years later, the Babylonians do destroy Jerusalem and the temple. That's King Nebuchadnezzar. You probably heard that name before. Um, Josiah is sort of a bright spot in the middle. This is a time when um, the, the Jews in Jerusalem are trying very hard to r restore and reform and do things right for once. Um, but nevertheless, Babylon comes and takes over. So the theological question for Isaiah in the north and for Jeremiah and Ezekiel in the south at that time is how could this happen? How could this happen to God's chosen people? How could such horrible misfortune happen? They had a kingdom. They had two kingdoms. Everything fell apart and they were destroyed. How can this be allowed? So the different prophets had different ideas about this. And when we get a little later with Jeremiah, basically his perspective was this. God's dream for the Jews is dead. Uh, the covenant is dead. It's been destroyed. It's been broken so much it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there is no covenant. A new covenant, a new dream for, uh, for, for God's people is needed, and it will be written on the people's hearts. Now, Ezekiel wasn't quite as bleak. Um, he said God's dream for, for the Israelites is not dead. It is bent all out of recognition, but it will come back to life again. And as Jeremiah said, in language that's similar, it will be written on the people's hearts. Drawing a comparison between drawing uh, between writing the law on stone on an Ark of the Covenant that could no longer be found and writing it on the people's hearts. But if you go back to Isaiah, he was not as bleak as these guys, at least not in his day. He did not feel that God's covenant was destroyed or bent out of all recognition. Isaiah would say God's dream has yet to be fulfilled all in good time. There is trouble now. There's all sorts of trouble now. There is, ter there is terrible destruction, and probably we deserve it. But someday, a descendant of David will once again sit on the throne of Israel. So, with Isaiah's perspective in mind, can you think of why, can you think, which of these prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, which of them do you suppose has become the most important for Christians? Isaiah. Isaiah. And can, and can you think of why that might be? Is he not our, like, descendant? Kind of? Right. So w when Christians look back on the book of Isaiah, starting right away in the early church, they immediately saw all sorts of resonances with the person they knew as Jesus. Right? They saw, oh, Jesus was, from, was a descendant of David. The, um, Isaiah said there would be a descendant of David on the throne again someday. This must be Jesus, just not in a way that we'd ever imagined before. Uh, you also have in Isaiah uh, some very familiar language that maybe you know most of all from Handel's Messiah. Um, you know, for unto us a child is born. Um, all, the, all the talk about a child will be born, a, a young woman will give birth to a child, um, and and that, that comes from Isaiah. Now, in the Gospels, the Gospel writers say the virgin shall bear a child. The word in Hebrew is not virgin. The word in Hebrew is young woman. And if they, if they had meant virgin, they would have used a different word. Um, but that's a discussion for another time. Um, so Isaiah's texts, um, you, you, all, you also have the, the suffering servant poems in Isaiah. All the talk about uh, uh, by, our, by his stripes we are healed, all of that comes from Isaiah as well and is easy to, uh, to lay alongside uh, the Jesus crucifixion story and, and, and resonates with that as well. So now the book of Isaiah is really a case study in just how complex the Bible can be. Um, you might imagine that um, the book of Isaiah with its 66 chapters, that a guy named Isaiah living at that time in the, what, the 8th century BC, um, sat down and wrote down 66 chapters. Uh, you would be wrong. We're pretty clear from, from biblical scholarship that this book was written in stages and possibly by at least three different authors over a long, long period of time that there was an initial book of Isaiah that was added to at later times. Um, 
In fact, here's the understanding of the history of its composition um, as, as spelled out in the liner notes of my new Oxford annotated um, New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And that is that of Isaiah's 66 chapters, chapters 1 through 39 are written at about the time of the Assyrian exile during Isaiah's lifetime. So we're talking 742 to 701 BCE. That's, that's sort of the era there. Chapters 1 through 39 then undergo some heavy editing during King Josiah's reform period. Remember, I talked about him as being the bright shining star for a moment there in the southern kingdom of Judah, trying to get everybody back on track with God's laws. This would be in the, the late 7th century, 600s BC. Um, and then chapters 40 through 55, we think were written from the perspective of the conclusion of the Babylonian exile, um, 559 to 530 BC. And that's where we get texts like, comfort, comfort ye my people. Um, you know, is, uh, Israel's time of exile is over. The idea there is that it's the end of the exile. King, per King Cyrus of Persia has taken over where the Babylonians left off. He has said that it's okay for the Jews to go back to their homeland and rebuild their city and rebuild their temple. So chapters 40 through 55 of Isaiah are much more joyful, much more hopeful, um, written in light of that event. And then the idea is that chapters 56 through 66 are written much, much, much later during the Persian period. So the 400s to the 300s BC, um, before the Greeks took over where the Persians left off. You know, one of the things that if you, if you like to get a grip on the, uh, on the whole sweep of, of history laid out in the Bible is to memorize the order of who invaded and when. And the good news is they're pretty much in alphabetical order. So you have the Assyrians, the Babylonians. For C, Cyrus of Persia, it was the Persians, but think of it as C because he was King Cyrus. So you have A, B, C. And then skip a few letters and do G for the Greeks, and then do R for the Romans. So on a really big macro level, that's, that's the order of the conquerors of, of, the, uh, of the Israelites. Assyrians, Babylonians, Cyrus of Persia, um, the Greeks, and the Romans. So today, we're going to have two readings from the Great Vigil readings. Uh, they are both from Isaiah. But the first one comes from the first portion of Isaiah's book that was probably written at the time that the Assyrians were invading the northern kingdom of Israel. And the second reading will come from second Isaiah. We, we put that in quotes because nowhere is Isaiah actually split into more than one book. This is a scholarly opinion. So we talk first Isaiah, second Isaiah. It's sort of a way of digging beneath. Um, so the idea, again, is that 2nd Isaiah comes after the Babylonian exile, 150 years later, after, the, after Isaiah actually lived. So we'll do the first reading, and I think I will pull that up on the screen and ask if there's someone who would like to read this for us. And I can blow this up bigger if you like. Actually, let me do that real quick. Um... Oh yeah, that's better. Now I'll share my screen. Would someone like to read, whoops. Would someone like to read this passage? Whoever goes first, because I've hidden all your faces. I can read it. <laughs> Thanks, KJ. Um, Isaiah four, two through six. On that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and glory of the survivors of Israel. Whoever is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, once the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over its places of assembly, a cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. Indeed, over all the glory, there will be a canopy. It will serve as a pavilion, a shade by day from the heat and a refuge and a shelter from the storm and rain. 
Okay, thank you, KJ. So can I admit something to you all? This passage is not familiar to me at all. I really don't know it. I mean, certainly I've read it before. I've read the whole Bible at some point or other more than once, uh, certainly in seminary, if, if, not, uh, if not completely at other times. And I don't know this passage. Part of the reason for that is that it doesn't show up anywhere in our weekly lectionary. Uh, the only place it shows up is as an option for the Great Vigil of Easter. Um, I've never used it as an option at the Great Vigil of Easter. Uh, I think that's partly because we have more readings available than we ever actually use. And I think this tends to be the first one to get cut. Why might we choose not to use this reading in particular? Can you, if you were a liturgist planning which readings to use in the vigil, why might you choose this one or not? And I can't see all your faces, so just unmute and talk. I looked at it just before we got together and I was somewhat struck by this um, business about the Lord washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and floods, cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem. It, um, and it sounded a bit judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the word judgment too. <laughs> yeah, well, there yep. it is. Yeah. So yeah, in the midst of a spirit of judgment and a spirit of burning. So mm -hmm. that certainly might be a part of it, I think. <laughs> it's not very polite language, is it? Right? No. <laughs> this is serious stuff. This is God's judgment. Now, God's judgment shows up all through the prophets and for very good reason, right? Idolatry, uh, social injustice, these are things to be judged. And that there's good reason for that. But when we hear just out of context and maybe not having enough context, the filth of the daughters of Zion, ah, I, I don't want that. Um, now, if, if you have the context, it's better. But we also live in a time when this feels like sexist language. It feels, um, I, I don't know, do, does your mind automatically go to, oh, the filth of the daughters of Zion sounds like that must have something to do with prostitution. Um, it, it probably does, and that's probably prostitution as a metaphor for idolatry, which was commonly used among the prophets. If you read the book of Hosea, uh, it's very, very hard to read through a feminist lens. I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, we also don't like the cleansing of the bloodstains of Jerusalem, spirit of judgment, spirit of burning. It makes us squirm. Now, that doesn't mean it's not appropriate to use. It's absolutely appropriate to use. It's just that we live in a time when there is less biblical literacy than there's been before. Um, it is harder to get past language like this without finding a place to put it, you know, a, a container to put it in. So when you see that there's another Isaiah reading, that is prescribed for the vigil that's a little easier to hear, I can understand why a liturgist might choose that one instead. Plus, it's much more familiar. Um, this comes from the first section of Isaiah. When everything was falling apart, Isaiah no doubt was very angry and very upset. Um, he, he didn't want God to punish the people, but he thought they deserved it. And so this is important. Now, it's easy though in this loaded language to miss the hope. Then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over its places of assembly. Look at this, a cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. Does that part sound familiar? What does that sound like? Remember when they are, they go to the Red Sea and there's the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, right? Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night that leads the Israelites. This is a direct reference back to that. So, in a sense, who cares that we just skipped over all those thousands of years intervening? We've just come right from the Exodus to something that references the Exodus, and it's a pretty neat connection. Um, Josh? Yeah, Bill. Yeah, so what is the reference on that day? What It must be a verse or two ahead of... On that day. You see? Yeah. What, what day is he talking about? What day about? is that? Oh, gosh, Bill, that's a, that is something... On that day is a phrase you'll find again and again in the prophetic books and in eschatological, apocalyptic books. On that day is about eschatology. And uh, this is a, just a good word to know. Eschatology means um, having to do with the end of all things, the consummation of all things, things finally getting to be the way God wants them to be. And you can take that in a limited sense and think of it as the end of human history. 
um, but you don't have to. On that day is sort of a day outside of time. It's, it's very hard to describe. In fact, we don't really have a lot of apop apocalyptic literature in our own day. And um, I've wondered about that sometimes. It's just, it's a genre that we don't do the same way that they did. And prophetic literature on that day. But here's a comparison. Think of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. When he talks about having a dream, a dream that someday, someday this will be, right? My children and the white children will play together. This will be. Does he mean a literal day in history? Well, we hope for that. But if that day never came, does that make his prophetic words useless? No, because they hold out the vision for God's dream for the world. So anytime you hear a prophet talk about on that day, He's having us move our focus beyond mere human history into the realm of what God actually wants for the universe. So does that help, Bill? Well, kind of. It's sort of the whole dilemma of Isaiah about whether, I mean, people argue all the time whether he was really talking about a messianic age and whether a lot of the passages that we associate with messianic predictions are really what he was talking about at all, right? I mean, that's part of the whole controversy. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, I would say that um, to describe a prophet as a predictor of the future, um, I, I wouldn't say that that's wrong, but I would say that it's a limiting way to talk about what prophets are for. Um, I would say that a prophet is someone who is resonating on a God level um, and isn't afraid to tell everybody that, right? So to whatever degree a prophet happens to predict the future, it's because the prophet was resonating on that level of where God, of, of what God wants, of that on that day, that time outside of time. Um, it's no wonder that so many things in Isaiah then turn out to resonate with the story of Jesus. It's no wonder that Jesus then identified himself with some of the things in Isaiah right? It depends on how you look at it. Um, I do not think that when Isaiah spoke that he meant someday 700 years from now someone will come to save you all. Because uh, what good would that be? How would that help the people at that time, right? They're, they're oppressed and, and being destroyed. Uh, if, if, you know, if, if someone told you, well, America's falling apart today, but don't worry, 700 years from now it'll be okay. Um, would that really help you? So I think that it's better to look at the words of the prophets as having more than one level. He was definitely speaking things to his own time, to his own people. But because the things he spoke were so deeply true on a God level, they get usable. They, they are usable again and again and again. And we have found a special resonance in Isaiah for talking about the life of Jesus and how Jesus as the Son of God, as the Christ, as the Messiah, fits into our story of salvation history. That might not be a satisfactory answer, I don't know, um, but certainly that's, um, that's where I've found a lot of help, is to just think of prophets in a bigger way rather than a smaller way. Um, I'll also point out that it's through the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning that things get to be okay later on or on that day. That judgment, judgment does not mean condemnation. Judgment means purification. And Malachi will really uh, give us uh, the best words for this. He'll, he'll talk about uh, the uh, the Lord coming into his temple and who can stand when he appears. He'll be like a refiner's fire and, and fuller's soap, right? If, if you want to purify metal, you put it in fire. If you want to clean something, you soap it. And, and that purification is what we're talking about by judgment, spirit of burning to purify. That's not a destructive burning. It's a purifying burning. And then things can be okay. So, um, according to Marion Hatchett's commentary on the American Prayer Book, this passage was used in many medieval Easter Vigil rites. So it's very traditional to be used on that occasion. And that's why it uh, comes down to us in the present day. Um, 
But the second reading we're going to do today is more popular, more well-known, and far more used, uh, certainly by me and, and, by, and in churches I've served at the Easter Vigil. In fact, the second half of it may sound very familiar to you, especially if you're in the habit of praying morning prayer. So I'm going to skip down to that one now. Let's see. Ah, good. I can fit it all on one screen. Um, is there someone who'd like to read this one? You know I'll read, but I always read. So. Yeah, come on. Uh, someone other than KJ. Come on, somebody. Just unmute and read. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lucy. Okay. And now I'm waiting for the words to come back. Oh, um, you should see them now. You got them, Lucy? Someone needs my video stop, so somebody go uh, ahead. All right, somebody else. Did you, uh, you guys. Do it, Billy? I heard you raise your hand, Billy. I saw you. Oh, I can't see anybody, so just unmute. Uh, I, can, I can do it. All right, go ahead, Bill. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, all nations that you do not know and nations that do not know you shall run to you because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, for God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and succeed in the things for which I have sent it. Okay. That's very different from the other reading, isn't it? I'll what stop. was this reading, Josh? It, what, oh, I'm sorry. It's Isaiah 55, 1 through 11. And incidentally, I think I said this um, before, before everybody was on the call, before we started. If you want to know where I'm getting these readings, I'm pulling them out of the Book of Common Prayer. And you can look in the Book of Common Prayer starting on page 288 to see all the various options for the readings for the, the Great Vigil of Easter, page 288. And in fact, that'll give you a jump on next week, if you like, because it'll have the other three readings that we'll cover next week. So I'm going to put the words back up on the screen in just a moment. I thought what we might do with this reading is, um, I, I'm trying to get back to how this informs a backstory, right? In Isaiah 4, we had gloom and doom and destruction, but we had a hint of hope. This passage, we're pretty sure, comes from a much later time um, and is added into Isaiah later as the fulfillment of, of a, a restoration of Israel in the sense that the Babylonian exile is over and the people can return to their homeland. That's a much more hopeful time. And it's also looking forward. It's, it's also, it, it hasn't let go of that on that day, right? It doesn't assume that this is that day. It is saying that that day is nearer. 
um, that that good things are going on. So, but it also it also projects into the future. You shall call nations that you do not know. It's it's expanding the the definition of God's role in Israel much much bigger. Um, yeah, the the first section was was God's presence in a renewed land. That was the idea: is to renew the land and have God be present in it. But this vision in Isaiah fifty five is much larger. It's salvation offered freely to all. Come and take it. Here it is. So I'm going to put the words on the screen again. And what I'd like you to do is just unmute long enough to share a verb that you notice. I want to see how many verbs we can find in this writing. So just go ahead and call them out. Come. Mm -hmm. Buy. Buy and eat. Mm -hmm. Spend. Pardon. Mm -hmm. Glorified. Listen. Incline. Thirsts. Eat. Mm -hmm. Call. Yeah. Run. Good. Seek. Seek. Mm -hmm. Call. Return. Yeah. Pardon. Return. Mm hmm. Pardon. Yeah. Good. Accomplish. Good. Succeed. Mm hmm. A few others that I spotted in there were delight, make, let and give. And uh, then you guys added the ones I didn't get when I was when I did my initial run. You added buy and send and thirst. So um, this is, it's a lot of wonderful verbs here. I'm just going to actually add to this list buy, send, thirst. So what I want to say is that Isaiah uses these verbs to get across what God wants to say to a decimated Israel that is at the very beginning of its hopes to become whole again. And if you just dwell on these verbs, you could do worse if you're trying to ascertain what God is like. I mean, listen to this, just the words, come, listen, eat, delight, incline, make, Call, run, buy, send, thirst, glorify, seek, let, return, pardon, give, accomplish, succeed. Most of those are very, very hopeful verbs. And one that really jumps out at me that I might have missed, but I didn't, luckily, is this verb right here. Let. Is that an active verb? I mean, I don't know if it's grammatically an active verb, but it's definitely a verb. But what is the act of letting? What is that? Like receiving, kind of. It's like, it, it's, it's not doing as much as it is doing, right? To allow. let. Allow. Very good, Derek. It's allowing. It's, I mean, this is a God who lets. This is a God who allows. What I didn't see in there was judge conquer, destroy, you know, th this is a very different passage, full of hope. Um, salvation offered freely to all. And I just love this. Come, if you're thirsty, come and drink. Yeah, it's the, it's the unlimited credit card. We just gave right. you a... <laughs> right, without money. You know, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. You know, is it still buying if you do that? Um, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy you? Like, why are you putting your efforts into this hamster wheel? Just relax. I was um, reminded this week of a congregation where I used to serve where the rector said, you know, I really just wish the people in this city would relax. I wish they just, I wish they just learned to accept God's love and quit working so hard. 
<laughs> I think that's there's a there's a gospel message there, um, and and I think Jesus resonated with this message. Um, just come, be, relax, um, have some wine. You know, <laughs> uh, love one another. It's the there are so many attitudes attributable to God in the Bible. Um, this is one of my favorites, and one of the one of the most common um, accusations made against from one Christian to another of any stripe is, "Oh, you're just cherry picking that Bible." Right? Have you ever heard that phrase, cherry picking the Bible? Oh, you're just taking what you like out of that and you're leaving the rest. Well, I think we might all do that. And I I think that to some degree, maybe that's okay. I don't think that it's okay to make it a habit where it's all you ever do, right? If you're never being challenged by this Bible, then you're really not taking the Bible seriously. But there is an overallness to the Bible that comes from deep, deep knowledge of it. Um, you don't need deep, deep knowledge of the Bible to hear these words from Isaiah and accept them and relax into them. But more knowledge of the Bible can help you figure out what to do about the fact that we have both this reading from Isaiah and the other reading from Isaiah. I didn't go through and look for verbs in the other reading, but um, Maybe we can do that now. Just a second. I, uh, I'm, I'm just going to take a chance on this because I don't know how it'll compare. Let's look at that other reading again. What are the verbs in this passage? Shall. Pardon, Billy? Shall. Mm -hmm. Can we use words that... Like washed or washed. wash, absolutely wash, mm -hmm. record or recorded, mm -hmm. create, cleanse or cleansed, mm -hmm. remains. Yeah. Hey, you know, this passage isn't so bad after all, is it? Remain, record, wash, Urge. wash, cleanse, My gosh. create. There will be. There's a lot of to be. Serve. So, you know, that, that passage has a lot fewer verbs in it. But here we were looking askance at this passage, old blood stains and filth. And, but the verbs in it are actually quite hopeful, aren't they? And that surprises even me because I wasn't, I didn't do that ahead of time. I didn't set that up. I just went, ooh, let's look at the verbs there too. Um, you can always find another level to these things. It's pretty gorgeous. So what questions do people have at this point? What's going through your mind? Well, well, isn't the lectionary sort of cherry picking the Bible? It's kind of like, well, if you go to church and you delve into the Bible through the readings that are on our recurrent cycle, you'll sort of get the meat of it, you know? It's kind of like... Obviously, there's a whole bunch of stuff that is consistent with the messages in the lectionary, which is also the basis for a lot of the sermons. And and yet, you know, our catechism, so to speak, sort of says, look, at, we've spent a lot of time picking these great. Now, we lost your audio there. Oh, Billy. that we're picking these great verses that sort of represent the essence of our of what you really need from the Bible. Yeah. And, and where do you suppose that comes from, right? I mean, there are layers. There are layers. And, and my friend Katrina uh, put it this way. I love this. Not all scripture is created equal. It's just not. There, there are parts that are more important than other parts. And we talked about this a little bit in an earlier session. And stop me if I told this story before in this class. I don't think I have. Um, when I was in seminary, we were reading the letter of Jude, which is the second to last book in the Bible. Did you know that? right? Jude Revelation. Well, does anyone remember what's in Jude? It's, it's kind of this bleak, judgmental letter about these people who aren't doing Christianity right and how God's going to smite them. And we talked about this letter in class and we, well, we never use this letter for anything. So why do we keep it? 
why, why don't we just throw it out of the Bible if it's not helping anyone? Why don't we just do that with any of the Bible? And I, th I think that's a really good question to ask in seminary. And the New Testament professor said, well, Christianity is long lived. We've had it for 2,000 years with the same canon of scripture, more or less, for most of the time. And what the letter of Jude might not be helpful to us right now. What if 500 years from now, another situation crops up in, in, our, in a culture, in a part of the world that we know nothing about now and couldn't possibly understand, where the letter of Jude is exactly what that people needs right at that moment? Well, we don't throw it out. We might keep it around. I mean, we're taking wisdom from the Hebrews, right? We looked at this in the first two weeks. We have two creation stories, not one. We have two Noah stories. They're interwoven together, but there are two versions. We didn't, the, the Hebrews didn't throw one out just because they needed to edit. And then how many gospels do we have? Come on, we have, you have to know how many Gospels we have. Four. <laughs> Four Gospels, right? And nothing annoys me more than when somebody tries to put out some edition of the Bible that harmonizes all four of those Gospels into one story. It does not work. That's not what it's for. It is four different tellings of the story well, of Jesus for a purpose. Yeah, Bill. Well, you bring up even a more difficult situation because, as you know, there's actually probably at least 12 or 13 extant Gospels from the first two centuries of the Christian church. And by the time of Arrhenius, we a bunch of them, right? Mm -hmm. So so if your argument is, well, we ought to retain everything that might be useful sometime in the future, we should open up the canon and at least say, well, the cutoff was 2000 uh, after the birth of Christ or the whatever, 2000 AD. And we'll take all the <laughs> gospels that were genuinely written before the year 2000 or 200, I mean, right. And then yeah, we have you know, at least a dozen gospels. That's a sticky wicket, isn't it? Opening the canon. I, I used to, I've said in the past, I think we should open the canon, open it wide. And then people say to me, do you know what kind of can of worms that is? Um, there are all sorts of writings that are helpful to Christians. They don't have to be in the Bible because of that necessarily. The part of that is the question, how did, how, did this, how did we get this Bible we have, right? And first, remember that it's not exactly the same canon of Scripture for all Christians all over the world. Um, Catholics and Protestants have a slightly different canon. The Orthodox have a slightly different canon. Uh, the Coptics have a slightly different canon. Um, it's mostly the same. But the question of how something gets to be sacred Scripture... There, it, it's almost like there has to be a moment where such a thing is possible, right? And I don't think that's the kind of thing you can force. And certainly one person doesn't get to say, well, I think we should add this to the Bible and expect that to get anywhere. It's kind of like, well, we have all these prophets we're talking about tonight, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ez Jeremiah Ezekiel. What about the ones who didn't get into the Bible? Oh, well, they're the false prophets. Well, how do we know? Well, because they didn't get in the Bible, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I see Matt. I see your hands, right? There's some circular logic there. Um, it's it's in, in, the, uh, in the early centuries of the church, they figured out what was going to go in the Bible. But here's the thing. Do you know how they judged what would go into the Bible? Not by what they thought was the, the, the most factual. That wasn't the scale they used. They based it on what was the most useful. What were the different communities of Christians all over the Mediterranean finding to be the most useful texts in addition to the Hebrew Bible? And that's how we got some of these in there and, and certain others not so much. There is an early text that talks about that, that utterly useful text to the Shepherd of Hermas. Well, the Shepherd of Hermas is a text that we still have, I think, but it didn't actually get into the Bible. Someone thought it wasn't useful enough. Um, so that would be a really great topic for another time, how the, how the canon of Scripture was built and what decisions they made. You know, Martin Luther wanted to throw out the book of Revelation. He thought it was terrible. He thought it didn't belong in the Bible, and he wanted it gone. Um, he also didn't like the letter of James. He's really famous for not liking that one. Um, he called it the Epistle of Straw. Mary, I didn't hear you. It looked like you said something. We're just agreeing with Martin Luther on James. Yeah, okay. You don't like James either? That's not, 
No, but do you not think that somehow this is holy scripture and that God had something to do with what went in and what didn't go in? And that's and that, and that it's not all man's decisions. I agree. I think I you're think right. That. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think that we should not underestimate the degree to which human beings made such decisions. But our faith is that God had a hand in this. I think more, more importantly, though, that we in our relationship with God had a hand in this, right? This is work we did together. In the same way that when we celebrate the Eucharist, we are all celebrating together. It's we and God all together who are consecrating bread and wine. I think it's the same way with the formation of the canon of scripture. We decided to have a church and God said, well, okay, that, yeah, I can go along with that. And, uh, and then we have a story that says Jesus instituted the church. Okay, so maybe it went that way. You know, it's kind of like how when you're in a really tight relationship, you don't always know who instigated the decision, right? The, the decision was made and you don't know whose idea it was anymore because you were so in it together. I think it's like that a lot with, with God and with the church. Um, yeah. Other thoughts? I like that what you just said, Josh. Oh, good. <laughs> Pastor Josh. Um, yeah, Bruce. This is kind of getting back to Isaiah. Has anybody ever put the idea forth that uh, since Isaiah's wife was also a prophet, that maybe there was some collaboration between the two of them in writing the book of Isaiah? That would be news to me. I have no idea. I, I just wonder, because it does mention that she was a prophetess, and so I just wondered if uh, anybody's, I mean, there's no proof of that or one way or the other, but it's just kind of a, a an idea. Teamwork. Teamwork. I might have been some teamwork there. Yeah. Hey, if you can find some scholarship on that, I'd love to hear about it. Let us know. I haven't heard any, but it just, uh, just the thought occurred to me. Yeah, yeah. That'd be neat. Well, and the other thing was we sort of forget that the Samaritans, even though there's only about a thousand of them left, still claim to be the real uh, inheritors of the true Judaism. And certainly at the time of still a very powerful force. I mean, they claimed that they had stuck around and preserved Judaism while all of you sort of pseudo-Jews ran off to Babylon and rewrote the Bible, basically, right? Well, a lot of so, writing went on in Babylon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, when Gideon and I were there, we actually met the um, chief prophet of the Samaritans, the remaining Samaritans, and they have quite a quite a, a profitable community in a, you know, a different holy mountain and issued and he had the genealogy and clearly articulated that, you know, that uh, there were really only one keeper of the true uh, Hebrew tradition. And mm -hmm. even though there weren't many of them left, they were still the real, they were the real Hebrews. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I don't know much about the Samaritans other than that. I think, uh, Bill, you and Gina certainly have a leg up on me with that. Um, I've kind of told you what I know other than um, what shows up in the Gospels. Um, Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well is a, certainly a, a good place to look for that. And, of course, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So we're at the end of our time. Um, next week, we will... Uh, finish this section with part six. We're going to hit two Ezekiel readings and also one from Zephaniah um, that I adore. Um, and really the only time that I ever dip into Zephaniah. He's one of these minor prophets that, uh, that we don't think much about. Um, and so I'm um, seeing in the chat um, that we've got several people who'd really love to continue, and I, I think that'd be great. I would also love to hear from those who want to continue uh, some direction about how we might um, recast what this class is uh, in an effort to uh, maybe bring in some people who, who might join us at that time and not necessarily feel like they've missed much right? It's, it's hard to, uh, to extend one class on over time because eventually you lose people. But if we can recast what this is in a fresh way, uh, that, that some people can come along, I'd love your thoughts on that. Um, and I think what I'd like to do is 
take a slower, more careful look at sort of the next tier of readings down. And I'll have to think really carefully about how to assess that because after these first few readings and it opens up really big, it might just be a lot more of my personal opinion about what stories we should look at. Um, I would certainly take requests. Uh, so let me know. Um, we should shift into our time for Compline. Um, and Mary said that she would lead us tonight. Anything else before we shift into Compline? All right, I'm going to stop. Thanks, the Josh. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, KJ. I'm going to stop the recording now, and we will uh, we'll post this online for all those who couldn't be with us tonight. Oh, just a second. I don't want to stop the meeting. I just want to stop the recording. There we go.